Hello, and welcome to the Data Color 2014 webinar series. Today our partner is Wacom. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in this audience who doesn't know what a Wacom tablet is. If there is, then you'll know a little more about them by the time we're done today's webinar. So we have Wes from Wacom with us, and if you would remember to put your GoToWebinar control panel in a place where you can see it, and open up the questions section, then, yeah, we have a test question in already, so that's perfect. Um, what will happen is if you type a question in, then depending on what the topic is, then myself or, or Wes will, will try to give you an answer to your uh, color management or Photoshop masking and compositing or Wacom related uh, question. So today's presenter, as often is the case, is David Saffer, who is a photo professional and educator in Southern California. And David is actually working with us from New York, New Jersey area today. He spoke at B&H Photo yesterday and did some, some, uh, made some videos with B&H, so he's in the New York area at the moment. And uh, we appreciate having him uh, sign on to do this webinar, even in the midst of his travels. So the topic today is masking and compositing, and you know there are not as many books published in the in the uh, Photoshop arena as there used to be. You know, real paper books that get translated and published around the world. And there are only two that I had anything to do with last year. One of them was Vincent Versace's book on black and white conversion, which I guarantee anybody who's interested in the topic can learn something from. That's uh, from Oz to Kansas. The other one was uh, Sean Dugan and, and Katrin Eisman, and, and a third author whose name escapes me at the moment, who wrote a book on Photoshop masking and compositing. And uh, in pre-reading that book, um, the thing that it really gelled in my mind is this is what Photoshop is for these days. Photoshop is not your pedestrian image editor. You know, you, you organize and, and make basic adjustments to your images in Lightroom these days. Photoshop is a tool for masking and compositing, and, and that clarifies it for me. As I look at an image, do I need to open this in Photoshop? If you ask yourself the question, do I need to mask it? Do I need to composite it? Do I need to work in layers? Then if you don't, then you're probably not ready to move it into Photoshop yet. So that's kind of the, the baseline for me of uh, what Photoshop's real key necessary skill set in this day and age is. So with that uh, definition, I'm going to hand you over to David Saffer and, uh, and just give you the hint that there will be both Data Color and Wacom giveaways at the end of this session. So stay tuned, and perhaps you uh, may get lucky with one of those. So uh, thank you for joining us, David. Thanks for the nice introduction, David, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, today's session is Fundamentals of Image Editing, uh, Using Layers and layers, Layer Masks, and Compositing and Editing in Photoshop. Now, oh, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, this is one of those topics which um, can bring strong people to their knees. I've taught this uh, subject many, many times. Uh, in fact, I have vivid memories once of teaching at Santa Fe workshops, and we were teaching photo editing in Photoshop and Lightroom, and also printmaking. And on Tuesday and Wednesday out of a five-day session, we were teaching layers, layers, masks, and compositing. And we literally had a couple of people weeping in the hallway in frustration. And I realized at that point that this is a topic that takes time to learn. And today's session is going to be focused on helping you understand the basic concepts and walking you through how these tools get used much much less on the really practical, down-in-the-dirt, fine level of detail than it is about the concepts and how they get used and why you should use them. And so with, with that in mind, I also want to mention something about, um, let me just minimize something on my screen here. I want to mention something about the webinar format that we're using is that because of bandwidth issues, it's not that easy for me to give you live demos of things. So I'm going to do my best to work around that limitation. I hope that you will still uh, be able to be satisfied with the kinds of explanations that you get. 
layers are a major part of the Photoshop engine. Layers are really the key to success in non-destructive or what we call you know, non-reversible editing. A new image is a single layer. It's like a, a layer of acetate. If you remember the old days when people used to do animation on sheets of acetate, they would draw part of a picture or an illustration on a, on a sheet of acetate, put another one on top of it, and draw another part of the picture on top of that. And that's pretty much what layers are like in Photoshop with quite a bit of extension to the concept. If you edit on a single layer, you change the pixels on the layer. And so unless you're willing to have 500 undos in your history panel, as you change those pixels, it's pretty hard to go back and forth. You can add just about as many layers as you want in Photoshop up to the limitations of the memory and the, and the processor power of your computer. Um, and when you're editing on a new layer, the layer on the top, it protects the layer underneath it, hence the term non-destructive editing. Now some of, these, uh, some of the effects that you can apply to a particular layer will pass through, but it won't destroy or change the pixels underneath. So here's a layer stack. In fact, let's go back to the beginning here real briefly. This was an illustration that I made that may give you an idea of what layer stacks uh, can do for you. You can see here that there's several layers of the same image stacked together. They're different colors. They're different layers of opacity. I even cut a window into one of them. And on this particular slide, again, we go back to the the analogy of using writable film or acetate and stacking it. You can add text to a layer. You can combine special filters and effects. You can cut out part of a layer and put it on another layer. So you can composite people, things, uh, objects, text. You can change blending modes, which changes the way light is treated, makes it darker, lighter, more intense, sharper. Um, and you can also paint on or paint off using masks. And that's uh, in part one of the, where one of the big strengths of the Wacom tablets come in, where you can apply or remove non-destructively treatments and edits and changes that you make to a particular layer. Let's start off with setup. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is talk about the photograph on the upper left where you can see a computer with two screens. Um, whether you're using um, a laptop and an extra screen, two desktop screens, uh, something like a Wacom Cintiq and an extra screen. I strongly recommend if you're seriously into editing in Photoshop or in, in, in doing other tasks that you, that you consider getting two screens. It's amazing how much time you can save just by offloading, and watch my mouse cursor, offloading all of your tools over to the left-hand screen. You offload all those tools off to the other screen, all of a sudden everything becomes easier. You can see your images full screen, which lets you see all of the detail and, 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 all, and all the glory of your photograph. And it makes life a lot easier. So this kind of setup is, on the, on the lower right, I think is ideal. We have very uh, unobtrusive room lighting. Uh, he's working his left hand on the keyboard and his right hand on the pen tablet. Uh, very ergonomically set up. He looks very comfortable. Uh, the lighting is not directly on the screens. Uh, the screens look like they're the correct luminance. Uh, hopefully, they're both calibrated. But in any event, this is the sort of setup that you want to start off with. Now, one of the other things is is to have an, a tablet like a Wacom Intuos Medium uh, or a tablet like that. It's it's an, it makes an amazing difference in the amount of dexterity and and your in your ability to pay attention to the fine details. If you think about writing on a piece of paper with a pen and holding the pen in that normal orientation and writing your name. And just imagine doing that. And now hold the pen in your fist and try to write your name. That's the difference between having a Wacom tablet and not having a Wacom tablet when you're trying to do fine work in Photoshop or another image editor. It, it's like night and day. The amount of fine motor control that you have with a pen tablet combination is light years ahead of anything else that you can be using. You can use the pen to draw, to select things, to paint. Uh, the size of your brush can change very, in, in accordance with the change in pressure. Um, there are a number of keystroke buttons on the pad, which include brush size. You can cycle through layers. You can scroll and zoom. All in all, it's a fabulous productivity tool. So you take a two-screen setup and a Wacom tablet, a pen tablet, 
you put those together and your Photoshop editing time will drop in half, at least, I guarantee it. Now, it may take, you, some people that have tried tablets like this have said, oh, it's just, it's too strange, it's, it's, uh, it's not the kind of thing that I like, and, and my response to that is it takes a few days. You have to practice with it a little bit, and once you practice with it a little bit, you'll never put it down again. Um, this is a Wacom Cintiq. Uh, this is a Windows 8 version. David, I think you had a few comments about this. Yes, but before I address this, I'm going to go back and address a couple of your previous comments. One is uh, you said you can offload everything to the monitor on the left. Which well, immediately, well, left to right or right to left. Yeah. Well, it immediately made me realize this is a right-handed person speaking. And then you, <laughs> then you spoke about um, the, in the move from a mouse to a tablet and the, um, and the differential in dexterity and, and, and fine motor skills. Um, if you are a left-handed person, not only will you probably reorder your monitors from what David suggested, but you will probably also find this interesting thing where computer mice traditionally sit on the right, and many of us have learned to use the mouse, clunky thing that it is, still sitting on the right, which means we're using our right hand for that. As a left-handed person, if you use your mouse on the right, you're going to gain double of all the values that David just described of using a, a Wacom tablet, because as soon as you pick up the pen, you're going to pick it up with your left hand, and you're going to do everything that you used to try to do right-handed with a mouse, left-handed with that tablet pen. So you're in a position now where not only are you gaining the, the virtues of dexterity and, and pressure sensitivity and, and fine point, but you're gaining the advantages of using the hand that you ought to be using for this kind of work to begin with. I don't know what percentage of users are left-handed and what percentage of left-handed people have put up with the right side mouse, but for any of you that are in that condition, I thought I, I ought to mention that. Now, what you're looking at in this image is a companion tablet. Now, the only complaint I ever hear about Wacom tablets, once people have taken the time and learned to use them, is that you're drawing in location X and your eyes are in location Y looking at the screen. So there's an indirectness to that. Now, the full-size Cintiq tablets are everybody's dream of how to solve that. Have your great big display be your touch screen and be able to, to draw directly onto your tablet. Now, that's wonderful, but not within reach of everyone, and it doesn't meet every need. Um, what we have here is a Windows 8 tablet. So this is a portable tablet. I won't say as portable as an iPad, but you know, in that uh, size and, and weight range, which is a full-fledged Windows 8 tablet. So as long as you're on the Windows platform, and as long as what you're looking for is a portable, this is a pretty intriguing device because it flips things around backwards. This isn't um, you know, the tablet anymore, this is the computer. This is a full-fledged Windows computer that you can run Photoshop and Lightroom and, and other imaging applications on. It allows you to draw directly on the screen of the, the tablet. So it's, a, <clears throat> it's kind of a new idiom. Now, uh, us Mac users would love to have this functionality on the Mac as well. I think if you, uh, if you think about the not invented here syndrome, you'll see why that isn't going to happen because only Windows is an open enough operating system to be put onto a third party uh, device like this. So that is um, something to can keep in mind if you're a Windows user, that this is a pretty interesting portable device. But also, this device can then hook up to your other monitors. You can use this as your um, one of your screens and you can hook another computer to it. Now, I have to point out the color management thing. Um, this, these companion tablets um, profit immensely from calibration. If you take a spider and put it on here and run a calibration on it, it does great things for correcting the, the color balance and getting your shadow detail right and so on. But also, if you're going to use any other monitors connected to one of these, you're certainly going to want to calibrate those as well. So we'll get into just a, a touching into monitor calibration later in the presentation, I'm sure. I just wanted to mention that that all relates right here as well. Thank you, David. Okay, thanks for your comments. So David brought it up. Let's talk for a couple of minutes about display calibration. I'm sure it's a subject that many of you are very familiar with, so I'll keep this short. But if there's one thing you can do for yourself, 
uh, as a professional in the, in the imaging world is to calibrate your display, whether it's, it's a Wacom device or it's a different kind of device. Uh, there's two reasons to do it, at least. Um, one of them is, is that calibrating your display is going to help you manage highlight and shadow detail. And the other reason is that your colors are going to be accurate. So when you're doing your editing and you're adjusting tonality or you're adjusting hue and saturation, you're making adjustments to a known destination. You're from a known starting point, you're going to a known destination. And that makes an enormous difference in the outcomes in terms of the fatigue that you experience, in terms of the quality of the, of the image that you produce. And it, it, again, if you, all of us think, well, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment to spend X amount of money on that new lens. Uh, but a lot of people hesitate to spend a relatively small amount of money on a display calibration device, and it's to their detriment. I think it's really a big advantage to have your display device calibrated to a standard, and that really gives you a head start when you start editing your images. Now, the way this works, um, very simply, is that the computer and the software and the sensor device, uh, which is the Spider 4, it's called the Spider 4, Pro or Elite are the two that are most popular. Uh, the software displays a series of color patches on screen, and the sensor which you see on screen here where my mouse cursor is, the sensor will read those color patches and the software will make evaluations and say that color is correct, that color is not correct, and make adjustments accordingly and write them into a lookup file, sometimes called a lookup table. That controls the behavior of the video card, which controls the behavior of the display. Every time you restart your computer, it restarts that aspect of your operating system and it's going to correct the color on your display. You need to calibrate computer displays about once a month. Once you've done that, now you have, again, you have your highlight ceilings and, your, and the floor for your shadow. Your colors are you know, right where they need to be. Green grass is green, blue skies are blue, skin tones look good. Um, other colors look the way they're supposed to, and your editing is going to go forward, and the final result is going to be much better. Uh, one takeaway for you, if you do have a calibration device or you're planning to get one, uh, you do a calibration, here's some recommended values for you. Gamma of 2.2, uh, a white point of 6500K or Kelvin, and a brightness level of 120. Now, m most displays come out of the box that are too blue, uh, which means that the, that white point number is going to be wrong, and the brightness in particular is much too high. It's in the two or 300 range. With brightness levels that high, anything in your highlights are going to be hammered, so the bright stress will have no detail. Uh, someone with blonde hair will have no detail in the hair. Uh, things like that, all that kind of goes away, and your shadows are misrepresented on screen. So you've really got to get the brightness under control. The number one complaint I hear from people in terms of screen and print maps is their prints look too dark. That means the screen is too bright. There's some tests built into the software. I won't get into a lot of details here except to show you that it's quite a sophisticated piece of kit. Uh, right, this teardrop represents the range of normal human vision. Uh, the magenta or purple triangle is Adobe 98 RGB, which is a pretty big color space. And this is a wide gamut display, and you can see it's slightly bigger than Adobe 98. So it's showing you that the calibration succeeded, and it shows you the range of color it's delivering to your eye. Now I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about layers and I have a layer stack going here and I'm going to show you some basic uh, concepts about layers. I hope that these will help you get further down the road uh, in terms of understanding how to use these tools and leverage them to best effect. So one photograph or even a blank sheet is a layer. So you can see this is our first layer here and this is what's called the layer thumbnail. If the eyeball is visible, the layer is visible on screen. And then if we go down to another one, I filled this layer with gray, so you can see that we have a layer on top and it's opaque. Now, how can you tell that it's opaque? If you look in the upper right here, this is grayed out at the moment, but this says normal. Normal means that it's an opaque layer without any special effects. I'm going to add a couple of objects, and you can see I've added layers. All I did really was um, take the select tool, uh, sorry, the shape tool, draw a shape on screen and fill it with a particular color. Each one of these becomes 
a layer, and these can be moved around the screen at will. I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, we'll go forward again to another screen. So here's another square or rectangle that's been added. I added a bar across all of them, and each one of these exists in its own space. You can move them around. You can put one on top of the other. As you can see, that they are layered, layer one, layer two, layer three, one on top of the other, with the bar across the through them. You can add a text layer. So right now you have a, a you should have an idea of what layers can do for you. You can composite. You can put dissimilar objects together. You can move them around. You can make them different colors. You can add text, and you can add special effects to them, which I'll show you in a minute. So one special effect, a very basic special effect with a geometric object. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. It's a layer via copy. You can make a copy of a layer also simply by going layer, new, layer via copy, and copy any one of these layers. That becomes a new layer that you can also move around. If you double click on the layer icon that you see over to the right, any one of those, you'll see this dialog box, and there are a number of special effects that you can apply to a layer, including a bevel and a boss on the edge. Uh, you can put a stroke or a key line around it. You can create an inner shadow, um, some special effects, effects that, are, that are called inner glow or satin. You can make a color overlay, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, I wanted to show you a drop shadow because it's one of the simplest and easiest to implement. And you can see right here in the middle that once I have drop shadow enabled, you can control how big it is, how much it spreads out, sorry, what distance it is from the, from the object, how much it is spread out, and what its size is. And here's an example. So there's before, I mean, that's after, and there's before. You can see the blue square. So you have quite a bit of control over what happens to that particular object in your layout. Uh, and again, I can move this around. I can grab a hold of this and move it over to the other side of the page. I can put it in back of one element and in front of another. I can add some of the other special effects. Um, all of these things are unique to Photoshop, I think, um, now at least in terms of the number of users. And you really have an incredible amount of latitude in, in combining different photographs, combining geometric shapes, special effects, et cetera, et cetera. So just to give you another example, here's two layers. The layer on top is a color layer. The layer underneath is black and white. And I'm just trying to show you how you can uh, metaphorically peel back this thing, and you can see what's underneath it. So I could delete this layer. I could make it invisible. I can do a special effect like grab the corner with the warp tool and peel it back and make maybe a book cover out of it, that sort of thing. So you can start to see how you can manipulate layers in a number of ways to make not only pleasing things, but also do some complete some practical tasks. Now, this is a portrait I took of a gentleman a while back, and I shot this on a white background. I realize that's a patented process now. Um, that's a joke. Uh, but you can use a Wacom tablet and pen, for example, to outline someone on a background. And you could use a number of tools here. You have a lasso tool. You have the polygonal lasso tool. You also have what's called the pen tool, which enables you to control each selection segment. And you can outline someone, and then you can erase the background. And all I did in this case was I outlined him, and then I went to, in the Photoshop menus, I went Edit Clear, and I cleared the background. Now I have this person cut out, and now there's three of them. So all I did was go Layer, New, Layer via Copy, and now I moved each layer over and composited these together. So I've now created a group of people, say for an advertisement, you know, his team is on your side. And you can even take it a step further. You can put a blue background behind it. And if I wanted to, and I'll show you how layer masks work in a minute, you can also use a layer mask and actually paint away part of a particular layer. But I think you can see right now that we've got a lot going for us in terms of flexibility, creativity, uh, the ability to create something new out of almost thin air. Uh, it's really a cool thing. And frankly, this is the kind of thing that you really do need a pen tablet for. David, before I go forward, do you have any comments to add? 
No, you're doing a fine job. I'll chime in if anything pops up. Okay. Now, one of the other things that you can do, um, and again, this has become something that's very, very highly adjustable, is you can create what's called an adjustment layer. Now, we're all familiar with adjustments like curves and levels. Excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water. And you can make a curves adjustment anytime you want, right on a particular layer, but that's what we call destructive editing, which means it's baked into the pixels. It's pretty hard to take it out of the pixels. So what one does instead is you come down here, you see where my cursor is to this little half cookie. If you click on it, you're going to see a bunch of different adjustment layers. In this case, I chose curves. And I made a curves adjustment layer on top of the pixel layer. I made my curves adjustment. You can see this is a slight S curve to increase the contrast, midtone contrast in this photograph. Now that's a, that's a pretty radical concept. It's not the photograph that's being adjusted per se. It's an adjustment layer that's completely invisible. It, in other words, as long, I change the blend mode on this to luminosity, which means it's a, it's a pass-through layer. There are no opaque pixels in this layer. All that's happening here is that the adjustment is made possible. Now what does that mean? That means you can stack them. So you can make a levels adjustment that you can see through. You can put a curves adjustment on top of that that you can see through. You can continue to add special effects layers one on top of the other. You can even turn one on or off in the layer stack and see what it would look like with or without that particular adjustment. So it's a very, very cool tool. Now, you can add a layer mask um, what one would do normally is take a photograph like this, and this started off as a color photograph with a black and white layer, conversion layer, on top of it. And I wanted to show you how you could actually use a layer mask to make part of that upper layer go away. So down here you would click on this icon. It would create a layer mask, which is it's an artifice of Photoshop. It's something that the Photoshop people invented. It's a way of controlling the way you see the pixels. So you can have a white layer mask and white reveals. So you have a white layer mask, or you have a black layer mask. Now, if you have a white layer mask, you can see everything in the layer. Nothing is hidden. And so it's fully in control of what's underneath it. You see the blending mode is normal. Now, if I go over here and I pick up the brush tool, this is my longest arrow here. So the long arrow is pointing to the brush tool and I go down here and I select black as the brush color, I can then paint away, in other words, paint over the white in the white layer mask and replace it with black. Black conceals. So now I can paint away. It's kind of like the Karate Kid. Wax on, wax off. So right now I'm waxing off. I'm waxing away the black and white layer and revealing the color layer underneath it. Now, imagine the possibilities for this with combining layers of objects, people, color treatments, special effects, you name it. It's one of the most powerful tools in Photoshop. Much, much easier to do with a pen tablet than anything else. I'm going to go back to my, my analogy, right or left-handed, if you're holding that pen in your fist and trying to write, or if you're holding that pen between your fingers and trying to write, I think you can see how much easier this would be, particularly to trace the edges of a complicated object. So layer masks are your friend. Now let's say I take this black brush and I paint away part of this and I decide, well, I'd like to paint it back in. All I have to do is switch the brush back to the color white, paint white over the area that was previously black, and white reveals. So in terms of concepts that I would really like you to take away today, the first is, is layers are your friend and, and you can stack as many layers as you want, combine effects and objects and everything else under the sun in Photoshop. The other thing is that layer masks give you an almost infinite level of control about what shows through, what covers up, that sort of thing. Um, you can use it for sharpening, for example, if you have a portrait. And let's say you want soft skin and you want sharp eyes. You sharpen the whole photo on a layer. You create a new layer. You apply your sharpening. You put a black layer mask over it, right? So now you're hiding the sharpening. 
Then you take a white brush and you just paint over the eyes. One, two. Now you have sharp eyes, nice, soft, smooth skin, and a beautiful portrait. Here's another example of using a layer mask and a blend mode. Now there's different blend modes. Multiply, for example, um, a lot of people describe a multiply blend mode as combining two transparencies, two slides that are identical, one on top of the other. And the density is doubled. So something that looks sort of light colored might become medium colored. Something that's near dark becomes really black, and et cetera, et cetera. So multiply is like doubling up. Now I've created a layer mask here. It's a white layer mask, so I'm letting the multiplied layer wreak its havoc on the bottom, on a whole image to start with. And then what I did was I went over and I got a brush, I changed the color to black, and I painted over an arc across the top of this image. And you can see right here on the layer mask icon where I painted in black that that effect is now hidden. Black conceals and white reveals. So now I've got an image that the emphasis is on the sky. These are buildings reflected in, in a glass wall across the street from where I was staying uh, in Phoenix. And I painted over this to hide that special effect. If I had left it alone, the whole thing would have looked kind of dark and gloomy. And I did this to illustrate what you can do with combining blending modes and layer masks. Now, I reverse this. I put a different blending mode. It's called screen mode, which is a rough equivalent would be, uh, let's say you have a projector running and you're showing a, a, an image on the screen and you double the brightness of the projector. So your highlights start to blow out, uh, the shadows start to come up, uh, and everything looks much brighter. It's, it's like a, a doubling in brightness. And then what I did was I put a black layer mask on it to hide it, and I painted over the top part of this in white to reveal the screen effect. So you can see that it looks the same, but the blend mode and the layer mask are reversed. So it's a very cool, very cool concept, very cool idea. It gets you into a space where you can combine objects, you can put, you can cut things out, you can paste people into photographs where they never were before, you can mask them out partially, uh, you can mask in a hand or mask it out of a, of a photograph, you can mask away wisps of hair, for example, if, um, if you were working against a white background. So there's a number of things that you can do with layer masks and, and, compositing, and compositing layers and things like that. Now this is an interesting treatment. This is uh, star trails that I took in Monument Valley, and we're using yet another blending mode called Lighten, which lets the lighter things shine through the layers. And this is a series of probably 100 to 200 photographs, all stacked together in layers, and changed to Lighten mode. And what it does is, as each photograph is taken, the star moves a little bit. And when it's in Lighten mode, it turns them from individual star streaks into long star trails. So you can get special effects going in here. Now one of the other things I did that you can't see here is I took a pen tool and a brush and I went into um, the burn tool, which is in the toolbar, it's out, off screen here, and I painted in a lot of the shadow down here so that you could really see the outline of that against the stars. Now this is an example of selective color change. Um, I wanted to pass this one over to, to David Toby and ask him to talk about it for a minute. Sure, this is uh, my example of, of why everything David is saying is true, but why it's never <laughs> enough. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. <laughs> what you're seeing in the upper left is um, three little apes, little three-wheeled, uh, trucks that the Tuscan farmers use, and they're parked side by side because this is a motorcycle parking zone and they're allowed to park in it. Um, so my first thought was, oh, how cute they are together, but then as I looked at the image after I'd taken it, the color combinations were not particularly pleasing. 
And so my first thought was just simply adjust the color in the middle to a more typical color for these little trucks. And then my second thought was, well, what about the, the three colors of the Italian flag? This is part of an Italian image series, so of course that would be red, white, and green. So what I ended up doing was removing the green from the body of the truck in the middle while trying not to remove the detail and the reflections and the other functions. Now, I'd love to tell you that I created a correction layer and I made an adjustment and I put a careful mask in and this is the result. And the answer is, yeah, times five. So probably there was one mask with one set of controls on it applied to this and another one built on top of that with further adjustments applied to that and eventually you end up with the results you're looking for. And uh, the beauty of it, of course, is it's all non-destructive and if you find as you move along that you need to change something you did in the previous layer, it's all sitting there for you to work with. Now, maybe I should have made the back of the green truck green again because he's used replacement panels on that truck that aren't green. I could, you know, you can go on forever. Once you start lying, there's no stop to stopping you as to how much you can lie. But the goal here in, in this image was to have it look believable, uh, to have it look real, and to have, you know, the detail remain in there while having the, uh, the color patterns be something that were both more pleasing and more, you know, kind of classically Italian. So that was uh, the method that was used to get this effect. I think it's a nice effect. I think it, it gives a lot of depth and dimensionality to the photograph that you wouldn't see otherwise. Yeah, that's interesting to think about the other things it does, you know, the depth and dimensionality, the fact that it putting that white truck in between the red and the green one uh, de delineates depth and space better. Now I could could add, for instance, a blur to the background that's progressive it, so it goes into the distance to, to focus attention on, on things other than, say, the flower pots and the road at the back and whatnot. So there are other ways that one could, uh, could strengthen this. And again, all of those things, once you're in Photoshop, are best done using layers. They're also, if you're going to do them in something other than kind of a geometric manner, are best done by creating masks. And the best tool for creating masks, of course, is a Wacom tablet. So uh, it all plays together here. One of the things that you mentioned along the way that I think it's worth re-emphasizing is that, and this, this comes uh, straight out of one of our earlier webinars on composition and, and layout, is that dark things go back in an image, light things come forward, sharp things come forward in an image, blurry things go back. And so in this case, to put a lighter image, a lighter object in between two tonally, you know, basically darker objects, creates a lot of, uh, uh, for me, a lot of a feeling of 3D, 3D, a lot of dimensionality, and makes it from an uninteresting photograph into an interesting one. Yeah, those are, those are the goals we're always looking to, to meet. Now, layering, layers and compositing are powerful tools, and, and it, it, you know, I have to encourage people, and I've, I've talked to a lot of, uh, of individuals and customers about this, and, and a lot of them kind of balk at learning these skills, but learning to use layers is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself as a, as a photographer, and you're doing your... your uh, your post-production work. It gives you so much more flexibility. You can turn a layer off and back on. You can paint it off and paint it back on, wax on, wax off. You can do so much more with that than you can with a flat screen setup. Uh, and of course, you can come back to it later. You can save it with the layers intact, and you can come back to it later, and you can re-edit it. And I think in some respects, with the advent of Lightroom, this is becoming a lost art, that a lot of people are, are accepting that there are certain things they can do in Lightroom and some things they can't do. And they don't really mix workflows, for example, between Photoshop and Lightroom. And they don't necessarily um, use the layers in Photoshop to their, to their greatest uh, benefit. Um, one book I would recommend that David brought up earlier today, Sean Duggan, Duggan's Photoshop Masking and Compositing. It's one of the best books on that topic I've ever seen. It, you have to. I have to admit, it's it's a dense book. There's a lot of material in there, and there's you know, 
there's a very, very smart man uh, that wrote it, along with Katrin Eisman, and I, as David said, I can't remember the third author's name either. I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, but there it is. Um, but this is one of the better books around. He's a colleague of ours. Uh, at least go and take a look at it and see if it's for you. And um, don't forget your friend, correct color management and screen calibration. You really want to be editing to the right destination. You want to put yourself in the driver's seat, uh, have at least your primary imaging screen calibrated, if not both, so that you know, you know what you're going to get. You're getting the right thing at the right time. Now, moving along. Oh, what is that noise? Caramba. OK. OK, I had a key stick. Sorry, folks. Webinars. We have 30 plus webinars recorded online. Um, we have a whole series of previously recorded topics. Uh, focus controls, remote triggering, composition. Uh, my gosh, there's a lot of topics. And there's not really a laser-like focus on color calibration. It's about how to be a better photographer. And although there's color calibration and color management mixed in with these topics, a lot of it is about how to be a better photographer, how to be more competitive, uh, how to make your work your own and make it distinctive and stylish. And so I think you should take a look at it. It's at spider.datacolor.com. I want to thank Datacolor and Wacom for sponsoring uh, this this webinar. I hope that you uh, enjoyed it and you, you know, that you got something out of it, that you have some takeaways here that will help, with, help you with your work. Uh, we do have two giveaways. Uh, I'm going to mention just the names and those individuals, please note that you'll be contacted by our marketing manager to get your information. The Spider 4 Elite uh, was won by James Rapp. And the Wacom Intuos Pro Small is by, is going to Rachel Hirsch. Uh, we have a discount for the Spider products. It's 20% off all Data Color Spider products, excluding the Spider HD, purchased on our website. The discount code is Image20. Uh, it's valid through the 10th of June for the U.S. only. I want to mention something. Is uh, first of all, our two presenters, David Saffer and David Toby. Thank you, David Toby. Uh, his website is cdtoby.com and his blog is cdtoby.wordpress.com. Uh, my blog and web addresses are on here. I think more importantly, uh, one thing I do for my students is I will answer questions via email. If you want to send me an email question, send it to dsaffer at mac.com. You can see it here on the screen. If I don't answer right away, that just means that I'm on the road or I'm otherwise unavailable or I've been buried by email, which all three happen from time to time. If I don't answer you right away, say one day or two days, just nudge me. Just send send it a, in the title second request and I'll do my best to get back to you. I thank you for your time and attention. I'm glad you joined us in our webinar. Uh, stay tuned. We've got more to come. Um, have a great day and a great week.